Welcome to the NDEP webinar series, the Dietary Guidelines for American 2015-2020. What are they? How have they changed? And how can you use them in practice? My name is Betsy Rodriguez, Deputy Director of the National Diabetes Education Program at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And today, I will serve as your moderator. Today, two nutrition experts will discuss recommendations for developing healthier eating patterns, suggestions for small, manageable dietary changes, and resources for putting the guidelines into practice. Before I introduce our presenters, I would like to go over the purpose of today's webinar, which includes the following learning objectives. Explain the purpose of the dietary guidelines and how they have changed and how they should be used in diabetes education. Describe the impact that changes to the dietary guidelines can have on the broader public health nutrition work name the tools to apply the recommendations in public health, and finally, identify aspects of culture that can facilitate the use of the dietary guidelines. This is the first of our four questions that we will be asking during our webinar. We call them knowledge check. If you are in front of a computer, feel free to answer it directly in your screen. And the question reads, the main theme of the Dietary Guidelines 2015-2020 is, I will give you a couple of seconds to answer. Eating patterns, food and drinks, compare diets to recommendations, guidance on chief and food choices, or all of the above. So our poll has been closed, and as you can see here, 85% of the participants answer all of the above, which is the correct answer. Good. As a brief background to food guidance and nutrition education, as early as 1970, the USDA and FDA worked together to devise recommendations called Choose Your Food Wisely. In the 1940s, the Guide to Food Eating provided the foundation diet for nutrition adequacy and included daily number of servings needed for each of seven food groups. In 1956, Food for Fitness, a daily guide, Basic 4, was published and included four groups, meal, meat, vegetable and fruit, and bread and cereal groups. Other guides follow up to the current my plate system introduced alone by the 2010 Dietary Guidelines for American. The initial approach of the early government document was to prevent nutrient deficiencies. All of the guidelines that have been published since 1980 are shown here. They evolve over time to make better use of nutrition science and to better communicate the science. The 1980-1985 version of the Dietary Guidelines were small brochures aimed at consumers. The information came mainly from the experts appointed to the Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee. The committee members drew from their collective knowledge of nutrition research. Then in 2000 version was a 39-page document that both for consumer-oriented and for policy documents. This reflects a move by the government toward helping nutrition educators, dietitians, and other nutrition professionals to better understand the science behind the consumer material. In, in 2005, then we got a 70-page booklet serve as a policy document and represented a departure by acknowledging that in nutrition education, nutritionists and policymakers all need the science in plain language that will serve as the foundation for their work. A search and review of the scientific literature serve as the basis for these guidelines. The 2010 document, again, was a policy document intended for policymakers to design and carry out nutrition-related programs and nutrition educators and healthcare professionals developing nutrition curricula, 
teaching tools, and advice for consumers. In 2010, a robust systemic approach was used to organize and evaluate the science on which the guidelines are based. For the reminder of today's presentation, we will be providing details, especially about the newly developed 2015-2020 dietary guidelines. That was a short, brief history to set the foundation for today's webinar. So let's have an, another knowledge check. What changed in the dietary guidelines 2015-2020? And again, let me give you another couple of seconds to answer. No longer have the quantitative requirement for dietary cholesterol, that's choice A. Choice B, added sugar quantitative requirement. C, emphasis on food patterns rather than individuals, nutrient, and specific food. D, all of the above, and E, nothing changed. So, most of the people answer all of the above, 68% of the people, and that's the right answer. Good. So, as you can see, there is a lot to cover today. So, as I said before, today we have a superb group of experts from the nutrition field that I'm sure will align us with valuable information regarding the dietary guidelines for Americans. I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Jennifer Seymour, a senior policy advisor at the Division of Nutrition, Physical Activity, and Obesity at CDC. She was CDC lead for the development of the Dietary Guidelines for American 2015-2020, a member of the Healthy Weight Commitment Evaluation Advisory Committee, and the Feeding American Nutrition Advisory Team. Then we will have Lorena Drago, founder of Hispanic Foodways, who specializes in the multicultural aspect of diabetes self-management education. She has served on the board of the American Association of Diabetes Educators and Latinos and Hispanic in Dietetics and Nutrition. Lorena is also an award-winning author of many diabetes books and chapters among other accomplishments. Welcome, ladies. Uh, Dr. Seymour, from now on, known as Jenna, the microphone is yours. Thank you, Betsy. It's very nice to be speaking to all of you today. So I am going to start out with some of the basic overview of the dietary guidelines, what it is, what it's not. So the dietary guidelines really provide evidence-based recommendations about a healthy and nutritionally adequate diet. It's important to know that they focus on disease prevention rather than disease treatment. So of course, as diabetes educators, a lot of you may say, well then, how is this relevant? It is important to know that, of course, a healthy diet is, is a really good thing for everyone to be thinking about, but it shouldn't really, the, the guidelines that are for disease prevention sort of in general should not override specific advice for someone who has a specific chronic disease. And I should say, let me just step back and say, and of course, Lorena after me is going to be talking much more specifically about ADA recommendations. So we'll really let you see both sides. And then, of course, the dietary guidelines, really, it's a policy of the federal government. And therefore, it informs federal food, nutrition, health policies, and programs. So it's important to understand a little bit about the way the guidelines are created. As Betsy pointed out, the guidelines have changed quite a bit over the years, and really, in the last um, 15 years have particularly gone much more from a, a very simple booklet for the consumer to much more of a, a, a very large policy. So in general, we think of the dietary guidelines from a three-step process. Um, there's a lot of detail on the slide, and I'm not going to go into all of it, but I think it gives you a little more detail for the people who really want to understand how the guidelines are created. 
What I'm going to say is that the first part of the process is a review of the science that is done by a federal advisory committee. And that advisory committee spends two years doing a really detailed process and ends up producing a report that is provided to the secretaries of HHS and USDA. This year that report was over 500 pages long, so it's a very intense detailed report about what we know about nutrition currently. Um, the second part of the process is the actual development of the dietary guidelines. And this part is really where the government takes the previous edition of the dietary guidelines, the report from the advisory committee, comments that come in from the public and from federal agencies, pulls it all together, and really works for, usually it takes about a year really to put all that together into what becomes the policy that is known as the dietary guidelines. And it's really important to know that, that currently this very large, you know, this document is over 100 pages long, is really designed for policymakers and for professionals and isn't really intended for the public to understand um, nutrition. But so that's where the third part of the process comes in, which is the implementation of the dietary guidelines, really figuring out how to use it. And part of that is about creating materials that will end up being for the public, but also part of it is about using this in the programs and, and all the different ways that the federal government might use these guidelines. And I'll talk about that in more detail at the end of the presentation. So what is in the guidelines? The guidelines starts out, it has an executive summary, an introduction, three main chapters and appendices. What I'm going to focus on in this presentation is the three main chapters, but there really is a lot of detail there for someone who wants to know a lot more about what's going on in the guidelines. So what are the actual guidelines? Because there are, there are five overarching guidelines that are a part of, of the DGA 2015 through 2020. The first guideline is to follow a healthy eating pattern across the lifespan. And this really is a very big change from previous guidelines that really focused much more on, I think earlier there was much more focus on specific nutrients. Then as things started to change over time, there was a bit more of a focus on food groups. But the real very big change with these guidelines is a heavy focus on eating patterns and really understanding that the whole way you eat is what matters. Um, the second guideline, getting at the same idea, is it's really talking about and focusing on variety, nutrient density, and amount. Really understanding that you need to eat a variety of foods. You really want to have foods that are very nutrient dense. This is getting at the idea that you want foods that have a lot of the nutrients that we need in our diets without a lot of the nutrients that we shouldn't be eating very much of, and certainly without too many calories. And that also gets into amount. Really thinking about the amount of food that you consume in terms of the calories that you are taking in. And then the third guideline is to limit calories from added sugars, saturated fats, and to reduce sodium intake. And so this is where we do get back to the nutrients that are real issues in the diet, but that this should be thought of within the context of that healthy eating pattern. So the fourth guideline gets at the idea of the need to shift to healthier food and beverage choices. And I'll really show you a lot more detail about shifts as we go forward, but it's really the idea that right now the way Americans are eating is really not fitting into that healthy eating pattern. And there are ways that you can shift your diet much more toward a healthy eating pattern. And then finally, the, the fifth guideline really is about that bigger support that is needed for healthy eating patterns to be possible for people. And it's really getting at the role of all the different ways that the food environment and, and where we live and, and where we work and all those different ways that we interact with food clearly plays a role on whether, in whether we are going to have a healthy eating pattern or not. 
Okay, so let's focus very much on what's in Chapter 1. This is where we really talk about the healthy eating patterns. So what actually is a healthy eating pattern? The most important thing is that it really encompasses everything that you eat and drink. A healthy eating pattern includes vegetables and really making sure you get a variety of those vegetables from all the different food, all the different groups of vegetables, dark green, red, orange, legumes, starchy, and other vegetables. It includes fruits, especially whole fruits, really whole fruits over having a lot of juice as the way you get your fruit intake. Um, grains, very important, and to make sure that at least half your grains are whole grains. Fat-free and low-fat dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, and for people who can't or choose not to consume milk, fortified soy beverages. And then, of course, a variety of protein foods, including seafood, lean meat, poultry, eggs, legumes, nuts, seeds, and soy products, and oils as opposed to the unhealthy solid fats. So, of course, a healthy eating pattern also limits saturated and trans fats, added sugars, and sodium. And what you might notice here is that dietary cholesterol is not listed here. I'll talk about dietary cholesterol in more detail in a little while. So, of course, within the key recommendations, there are also a number of quantitative recommendations that really do get at very specific um, areas where we, we know that there need to be limits on how much someone is consuming. The, the big addition in these guidelines is to consume less than 10% of calories per day from added sugars. Something that's been more consistent in the guidelines over a number of years is to consume less than 10% of calories from saturated fats. Also quite consistent over the years has been to consume less than 2,300 milligrams per day of sodium. And then finally, also certainly for the last two editions of the guidelines, if alcohol is consumed, it should be consumed in moderation, which is up to one drink per day for women and up to two drinks per day for men, and of course only by adults of legal drinking age. And then finally, not a quantitative recommendation, but there is a recommendation to meet the physical activity guidelines for Americans. In the past, the dietary guidelines often did also talk about physical activity sort of as an aside, and eventually it became clear that there really should be physical activity guidelines. And so in 2008, that's when physical activity guidelines were created for the first time. And there's a lot of detail within those guidelines and maybe, maybe another webinar on physical activity guidelines would be a good thing. <laughs> so of course, it's important to really think about the principles of healthy eating patterns. Really understanding the idea that a diet as a whole is what matters, that really understanding that there, there are synergistic ways that our diet works together, that what you eat, what you drink, they have an impact on each other, and that really just thinking in terms of eating more healthfully as just having an impact on one aspect of, of your diet is, is really probably not going to get you to a healthy eating pattern. It's also very important to know that nutritional needs should really be primarily met with foods as opposed to supplements. There are certainly needs for supplements for, for various people and for various different reasons, but there is so much more to the food that we eat than what is in supplements. And so it's really important to get away from a message that I have heard in the past of someone who says, oh, I can just take a multivitamin and then I'll be okay. And there really is so much more in our food that you will never get from a multivitamin. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. And then, of course, it's really important to know that healthy eating patterns are adaptable. They really can be tailored to all kinds of sociocultural and personal preferences. And there are many kinds of diets that can fit into the overall broad perspective of what is a, a healthy eating pattern. So what is the science behind healthy eating patterns? So in general, a lot of people may think when they know about the dietary guidelines about using scientific studies to determine 
what might be said in the dietary guidelines. But there actually is a lot more that goes into certainly those systematic reviews of scientific research play a very important role. But there's also a really a need to think through sort of food pattern modeling, really trying to understand how can you really go through and figure out all the ways the person can get the nutrients that they need while staying within calorie limits, while also not getting too much of the nutrients that, that we are eating too much of currently, and really trying to think through all of those aspects and come up with patterns that from out of that modeling. And then of course it's also important to realize that there's a need to analyze current intakes, really understanding what's already going on, what needs to be improved within diet, and how does that play into what is going to be suggested as a healthy diet. So let's look at a little more detail about a couple of things. I already did mention the variety of vegetables, but it's important to know that within vegetables, all different forms of vegetables can be a part of a healthy eating pattern. You can have fresh, frozen, canned, dried options, and including vegetable juices. But of course, you should keep in mind, again, the idea of nutrient density. Vegetables should be consumed in a nutrient-dense form with limited additions of salt and butter and cream sauces. Also, with dairy, we should really be thinking about including fat-free and low-fat, 1% dairy, including milk, yogurt, cheese, or fortified soy beverages. I did sort of in the corner of my eye see that someone asked a question about rice milk and other things like that. This was addressed um, by the Dietary Guidelines Committee. And what they looked into and really decided was that a big role that was being played by the dairy products in our diet was as a protein source. And that soy milk has a pretty consistent amount of protein as compared to dairy products, whereas things like rice milk and almond milk and other forms do not. And so that is why they chose not to include other forms of, of beverages besides dairy in this recommendation. So fat-free or low-fat milk and yogurt in comparison to cheese contain, contains less saturated fat and sodium and more potassium, vitamin A and vitamin D. So it's important to also think in terms of when you're thinking about the dairy products that you consume that there really are different choices that can be made that would be better for a healthy eating pattern. So, of course, there are all those other components within a healthy eating pattern that really need to be thought about and considered when figuring out what to eat. And they include added sugar, saturated fat, trans fat, dietary cholesterol, sodium, alcohol, and caffeine. And I'm going to focus on, on two specifically next that, that have been talked about a fair amount since these dietary guidelines were released. The first is cholesterol. So the quantitative recommendation was removed, but there is a statement in the, in the guidelines that say individuals should eat as little dietary cholesterol as possible while consuming a healthy eating pattern. Now, I saw a question before the, uh, the webinar began that asked about this, and so I want to specifically point out that if this sentence stopped, after the word possible, it would have a very different meaning. So this is not suggesting that people need to drastically limit their dietary cholesterol intake. What it is saying is that people should eat as little cholesterol as possible while consuming a healthy eating pattern. And that's an important addition because really when you look at, say, the dietary guidelines look at a healthy U.S. style eating pattern and really took general U.S. style habits but came up with a healthy eating pattern that met all the criteria and really found that within that, the diet was getting between 100 and 300 milligrams of cholesterol. And so it's really, it's, it's not actually saying as little as possible because, of course, 
you could get to zero by eating absolutely no animal products, but that is not what the dietary guidelines are suggesting. So I think that's a, an important point to keep in mind. So for caffeine, um, there was discussion, it's not a key recommendation, but there was discussion about the fact that, um, that people can consume caffeinated beverages. What's important to know here is that most caffeine evidence focuses on coffee. So there really hasn't been the kind of studies on all kinds of other caffeinated beverages. And so this recommendation should not be taken as a recommendation to consume a whole bunch of other caffeinated beverages. But that it really does say that three to five eight ounce cups per day can be included in a healthy eating pattern. It's important to note though that there's nothing that suggests that a person who isn't consuming caffeine really should start in any way. And it really is also important to think about the, what else you get when you are having caffeine in your diet. Um, thinking about all the different creams and, and whole and 2% milks or added sugars that are put in a lot of caffeinated beverages really need to be thought of in terms of the calories that that adds to your diet. So I won't go into much detail here, but just want to say there are a lot of call-out boxes in the dietary guidelines that go into any number of details about a whole bunch of, of issues that may be of interest to people. And I think one thing that's important to note, and again, I saw some questions um, from when people registered about different kinds of diets. There are all kinds of diets that can fit the healthy eating patterns described in the dietary guidelines. There are three specific ones that are described and pointed out in the dietary guidelines. That's the healthy US style eating pattern, the healthy Mediterranean style eating pattern, and the healthy vegetarian eating pattern. And so yes, vegetarianism definitely can fit within the guidelines and, and it does show that pattern in the guidelines. But there are other healthy eating patterns that are outside of these three that, that clearly would fit within the dietary guidelines. So there are a lot of different ways to, to meet the guidelines. So now let's shift to shifting eating patterns. This is the content of chapter two. So what's important to see here, and I'll try to make this picture as clear as possible pretty quickly. Think of the orange bars as so more the negative and the blue bars as the positive. What this graphic is really showing here is that there are areas that need a lot of work um, for Americans. You can see that Americans are just not eating the vegetables that they should, that over 80% of people are not getting enough vegetables. Um, it's really 75% not getting enough fruit. Total grains looks a little bit better, but I'll, uh, I'll show you why that might not be so good on the next slide. Dairy products, really over 80% again, not getting enough. Protein foods, again, looks a little bit better, but there might be something more behind that. Oils, as opposed to, to solid fats, really there's still more need to shift that as well. And then you can see going in the other direction, people are consuming way too much added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium. Really got close, we're getting up there close to 100% of people consuming more sodium than they should. So like I said, I want to make sure for the two areas where it looked like things were, <laughs> were in pretty good shape for Americans, it's important to look at this in a little more detail. So for whole and refined grains, if you look at the blue bars, that represents the recommendations. And then the orange is refined grain intake, and the green is whole grain intake. And so what you can see is that overall for most men, and then the second column is women, you can see that our refined grain intake is well over the recommendations, except for some older men who are getting very close there but the intake of whole grains is well below recommendations. So overall grain consumption is in fairly good shape among Americans, but we need to change the types of grains that are consumed. 
And the same thing for protein. I'll just specifically show this chart on seafood intake. So if you look at, again, the blue bars being recommendations and the orange being where intake is, you see we're all well below the recommendations for seafood consumption. So just let's think a little bit about the way you might shift toward healthy eating patterns. So it's things like increasing vegetables in mixed dishes while decreasing the amount of refined grains, meats, high in saturated fat, and, and or sodium in those mixed dishes. You could think of it as the, the pizza that you really might want to start moving toward a whole grain crust that's got a, a, quite a bit more vegetable on it and removing the pepperoni and <laughs> um, really thinking from those perspectives, that perspective. Really trying to make sure you're adding seafood into meals twice per week and replacing the meat, poultry, and eggs. Using vegetable oils in place of solid fats and things using oil-based dressings and spreads on food instead of those made with solid fats like butter. Choosing beverages with no added sugar like water. And using the nutrition facts label to compare sodium content in various foods. These are just a couple of ideas of things, the kinds of shifts you can do toward healthier eating patterns. So I think to save a little time, I'm going to skip past that, that um, overview slide and just go to, let's look a little bit at the food sources of some of these, um, these nutrients that we really need to reduce in our diets. What you can see is certainly for added sugar, the plurality coming close to the majority of added sugar is coming from beverages. And so this is a really big component of the added sugar intake. If you add in snacks and sweets, that makes up 78% of the added sugar that people consume. And so right there, those really are the big areas to be thinking of in terms of how to reduce added sugar intake. If you look at saturated fat, the, the bulk of saturated fat is coming from these mixed dishes. That's things like the pizzas, the burgers, the meat, poultry, seafood dishes. You could think of these as the stews, the soups, the rice and grain dishes. These are all the different things that make up what are these mixed dishes. And then you can see that there's also a big component made up of snacks and sweets. So, and then if you look at sodium, again, it's the mixed dishes and there's a fairly big component um, also from snacks and sweets. I wouldn't put that in as, the, as one of the higher ones for sodium, but it really should be thought about the mixed dishes, the snacks and sweets, and then the beverages kind of together as a bulk area really are where the sodium, saturated fat, and added sugar are coming from. And so those are real areas to focus on in terms of trying to move people toward the fruits, vegetables, grains, low-fat dairy, and good protein sources, and moving away from these areas where, where people are getting really heavy nutrients that we want to stay away from. Okay, so then the third chapter is really focusing on supporting healthy eating patterns. So I certainly hope that a lot of you have seen the socioecologic model. This is one particular um, version of it. What I would say is if you start over to the right in the yellow section of this, you can see that this is really where a lot of people talk about nutrition and really changing things within nutrition, talk about it from those individual factors, from the perspective of the food and beverage intake and the physical activity for an individual. But there really are so many different ways that the settings that people are in, the, the early care for children, the schools, for adults, their work sites, and for everyone, the recreational facilities, the food service and retail establishments, these are all areas where you can constantly be barraged with all the wrong foods to eat, or you could really have an environment that allows and makes it so much easier for people to consume the foods that would be healthy for them. 
And of course, there are also the sectors, the government, tra how transportation affects people, all the different agriculture, food and beverage industry, retail, and how all of that affects people's intake. And then of course, there are all the social and cultural norms and values that go into how and why people eat. And it really is important to be thinking about and taking into account all of these different aspects in order to really be thinking about how to help people get to those healthy eating patterns. And then just quickly, I want to talk a little bit about, so this is getting at some of the tools on, on the more environmental or policy end. There are so many different ways that the dietary guidelines are used. For instance, in schools, I think probably a lot of people have heard, because it's got a lot of attention, the changes to the school breakfast program, the changes to the school lunch program, the changes to competitive foods in schools that were known as smart snacks, all kinds of wellness policies, the changes to food in the child and adult care food program, as well as things like in work sites, we currently at, at CDC have food service guidelines that, that we put together based on the 2010 dietary guidelines. They are currently right now being updated and being expanded to include the entire federal government to create guidelines for the food served throughout the federal government that will be based on the 2015 through 2020 dietary guidelines. And these trickle down. States end up using them to come up with state guidelines for the food that would be served in any state facilities. Local facilities can do this also. And then also just private work sites can take this on as well. And we've seen a lot of private work sites set standards about the kind of food. And all of this, the, the food service guidelines that I'm talking about, are based on the dietary guidelines. To look at it from a more, more direct to consumer perspective, I know that, that Betsy at the beginning talked about MyPlate briefly. So MyPlate is created by the Department of Agriculture, and it really is a simple graphic that represents the dietary guidelines. It really shows the, the idea of, of a plate and the proportion of foods on that plate in terms of trying to get at the idea of, of what a healthy eating pattern would look like. And there's a lot more detail, and they go into any number of examples and really thinking through the idea that maybe not everyone eats on a plate. And so there are other ways of thinking about those foods. And, and there's a lot of information, and it really is a very good source for people to really be able to track their own diet, to track some progress, to really get some understanding about the details for a more general audience than the dietary guidelines themselves. And then finally, I wanted to give one example. There are, there are many out there, but one example of the way the dietary guidelines are being used to really make a big difference to the labeling of food. So there was a whole process to change the labeling of food that started long before these dietary guidelines. Um, but the process was very much influenced by what was being changed in the 2015 through 2020 guidelines. And when, when the guidelines came out, some, some issues were tweaked here. So what you can see on the left is that is the current nutrition facts label that is what a lot of people have probably seen if they look at packaged food to, to see what is in it. The label on the right is how it is going to change. And some foods have already made this change. The new label was announced just quite recently, just a couple of months ago from FDA. Manufacturers have, big manufacturers have until 2018 for this change to happen, small manufacturers until 2019. But you will start seeing this as companies get it ready and are ready to make the change. And some things that I would point out are a much bigger serving size so people really understand um, what this information on this label, it's about how much 
of the food that is in that product. The calories are much bigger to really make sure that people are seeing this and calories from fat have been removed since there really has been much more of a move towards saying people should consume healthy fats, not unhealthy fats, as opposed to telling people that fats in general are bad. You can see that if you go farther down in the list that added sugars have been added to this and the percent daily value is based on that 10 percent of calories as a maximum recommendation that is in the dietary guidelines. There are a number of other changes. I could only show really uh, these two on, on here, but I would advise anyone who really is much more interested to go and see because there really are going to be for packages of food, like say a 20 ounce soda, that people really might drink at one sitting, that is now going to have a label that describes what is in that full 20 ounce soda because really is likely to be consumed all at once. And it was very confusing for people to see an eight ounce soda and and they might assume that what they were seeing on that on that label represented what was in that 20 ounce soda. And there will be any number of other changes that I think would take a little too long to go into here. So now I just want to point out that as I've said, there are so many things to see, so much more detail here. So dietaryguidelines.gov is the place to go to get all the information, to see the dietary guidelines. This is where you can download a copy, a PDF of the guidelines. This is where you can order a hard copy of the guidelines. There are additional resources at health.gov and at choosemyplate.gov, which is where the, all the MyPlate information is. So there's a lot more to see here. So now, before we, uh, before we turn over to Lorena, we just have one knowledge check question. So this one is, do you know how the dietary guidelines for Americans are used? So A, is it to learn how to control diseases like diabetes? B, to inform policymakers and health professionals, not the general public? C, to teach health providers how to educate their patients? D, all of the above, or E, none? So 70% of people said all of the above. The answer is actually to inform policymakers and health professionals. Uh, so I do think that it is important to make clear that, like I said, the dietary guidelines are designed to be for disease prevention, but not really to control specific diseases. And we did think when we were talking about this that that third one, teach providers to educate patients, could be a little bit confusing. I certainly think that the guidelines is a resource for professionals to read and understand, but I wouldn't say that there's anything in it that directly teaches providers how to educate patients. So, so really the informed policymakers and health professionals is, is the correct answer there. Okay, and so now I am going to turn the presentation over to Lorena. Thank you very much, Jenna. That was great. I was taking my notes as well. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So let me just move quickly into the second part of the presentation, and that is the American Diabetes Association nutrition recommendations and pretty much the practical application. So how do we take this information uh, for patients with diabetes and how do we put it all together when we are teaching patients and their families about food? So I will be pointing out what are the similarities as well as some of the differences in both the nutrition guidelines as well as in the dietary guidelines. So one thing that Jenna had talked about at the beginning of her presentation was how the emphasis was really on dietary patterns. So not just a specific quote-unquote diet or not something that is extremely prescriptive, but we are learning 
that not one size fits all of eating approach. So that means that we have an array of different dietary patterns that fit and also that can work very well to accommodate the patient's socioeconomic status, cultural, and eating habits. So at the end, the eating pattern should emphasize glucose, blood pressure, and lipids. And we want to emphasize that the eating pattern, the recommendation should fit the individual and his or her needs, and that it's ideally uh, provided by a registered dietitian. So I am going to focus on just a few nutrients and look at the recommendations. The first one is carbohydrates. When I first started teaching diabetes education, there was a lot of prescriptive amounts of what the recommendation should be. It was either 50%, 40% of the calories, 30% if you were recommended a low-carbohydrate diet. So as the recommendations have changed over the years, those numbers have changed. Now, ultimately, the evidence is inconclusive for an ideal amount of carbohydrate. So this has to be done collaboratively with the patient, looking at their blood glucose levels and other parameters, as well as keeping that enjoyment of eating and food. So the amount of carbohydrates and the available insulin will be the most important factor that influences that glycemic response. And that is what should be considered when we are recommending a meal pattern. So for patients that have type 2 diabetes, if there is enough endogenous insulin, the best approach is to look at their blood glucose levels, preprandial, postprandial, and then based on those recommendations, as well as other markers, that should be the carbohydrate, the amount of carbohydrate that should be recommended. And that is usually how I approach the recommendation of the carbohydrate. So it could range between 30% of the total daily calories to 40 to 50%. Again, taking into account that not one size fits all and that I want to look in general at the patient's profile and their blood results in order to make a recommendation about the amount of carbohydrates. And I usually use diagrams, which I will share with you later on in practice, as to how does this look. So I do show, well, we need the carbohydrate that you're consuming, but we also want to take into account your endogenous insulin or the insulin that you are using and then that will determine whether your blood glucose levels are elevated or they are not. And there are other nearly multiple factors to change those numbers. So after giving that prescription, what would be the best way for the patient to monitor the amount of carbohydrates that they are consuming? It depends on the patient and also the level of literacy of that patient and prior education. So I already know that patients that only want to use their hands as a guide, then I would indicate the hands to provide them with an average of the amount of food that they are consuming. There are other individuals that like to know the exact amount of carbohydrates that they are eating and they are using apps or they are just simply counting their carbohydrates. And that also works for them. For other patients, I choose the plate method because I find that by using the plate method and kind of guesstimating the amount of carbohydrates is perhaps easier for some individuals that may have numeracy problems and they are not as adept at multiplying and adding. So whatever method you use, there are many different ways and the evidence is level B. And this is the level of evidence 
So that means that this is supported by well-conducted cohort studies. And I think that that gives the educator a great way and latitude to making a selection that suits the patient. So where do this carbohydrate should come from? Vegetable fruits, whole grains, legumes, and other sources that are nutrient dense. So here, it aligns with the message of the dietary guidelines. The sources, the nutrient dense density that Jenna had mentioned at the beginning, the variety of the different fruits and vegetables. So we are pretty much preaching exactly the same message. And of course, we're talking about the amount. I always like to use the P's and Q's. And when I talk to patients, I always say, remember the P's to mind your P's and Q's. P for portion and Q for quality of the food. And if most of the time you're minding your portions and the quality of the food, you are probably doing everything the right way. So here we have again how to translate the message of nutrient density that will be the quality, and the amount that will be the key for portion, minding the P's and Q's. What about sugar? And I wanted to include this for two reasons. Because the recommendations uh, for ADA do allow for some amount of sugar consumption, as long as you're substituting for the same amount of calories of other carbohydrate foods. Now, what happens is that the recommendation has to be very clear to the patient that while it might be okay to substitute for another food that has equal amounts of carbohydrates, we have to go back to the original message of nutrient density, and that is what should prevail. The other issue is where does the added sugars are coming from and the excess consumption of added sugars. And in certain communities, it is extremely important to always address what beverages is the patient or the community that you're teaching, what are they drinking. And that should be part of every single assessment, in my opinion. Another recommendation is the emphasis of consuming fruits in its natural state when possible because of the fiber and the nutrients. And juice, even when there is no added sugars to the juice, even when the patient says, I drink juice because it's natural and I do not drink sweetened beverages, it is still very important to relay the message that most of us do not drink two to three ounces of juice. Most of us in our homes do not have glasses that only hold three to four ounces of juice. So most likely, the average person might be drinking between eight to 12 ounces of juice per day. And that has an impact on blood glucose levels. Remember, what affects blood glucose levels is the amount of carbohydrates and the amount of insulin available. So if the amount of carbohydrates increase by the increase in consumption of sugars, even when they are coming from fruit juice, that will have a negative impact on blood glucose levels. So again, the key message is consume fruits in its natural state when possible, but be mindful of the juices because that will be one item that the patient or the client is not going to consider to have a problem later on. So here it is, um, something that again perfectly aligns with the recommendation and that is sugar sweetened beverages. And I have added a picture of ginger. The reason that I have ginger is because most people, at least the communities that I serve, do not consider uh, ginger ale or other sweetened beverages 
to have the same impact as colas or sodas that are not. So pay attention, especially when you're communicating with patients that have low health literacy. It's very difficult for them to sometimes translate the message. So if you say, do not drink sodas or sweetened sodas, they might not translate that message to ginger ales or any other sodas that you have not mentioned. So that is just one tip that I have found out to be true most of the time. I'm moving on to fats because the other recommendation with the dietary guidelines was about fats. And once again, we used to have a very prescriptive message in the past that 30% and perhaps the nutritionists, the dietitians in the group would probably remember no more than 30% of the calories should come from fat. Well, here, again, it appears that it's also inconclusive and the goals have to be individualized. We went through the fat-free years in which everything was fat-free, and then what happened was once the fat is removed from a product in order to have more palatability, more carbohydrate was added. So the consumption of carbohydrates increased to replace the fat, and then that had a more detrimental effect on the cardiometabolic profile. So be aware of sharing that message that we have shared for so long. It is also a little difficult to, to say not all fats are bad, and that's part of the message, but also that the quality is important and remember the P's and Q's. Even when you're sharing the types of fats that are healthier, it has to be conveyed into the right amount, and it has to be part of that eating pattern, not isolated nutrients. And then I just want to focus on the saturated fat, the cholesterol, and trans fat, that the recommendations are the same as that recommended for the general population. Therefore, the recommendations of saturated fat will be less than 10% of the calories. The sodium recommendation, it will be exactly the same of less than 2,300 milligrams, again, very much aligned with the dietary guidelines. One thing that is very important, and that's why I had that folder there of top secret salt mission, is that most people believe that most of the sodium that they consume comes from the salt shaker. And that's what I love Jenna's slide that showed that almost 50% of the sodium that we consume are the mixed dishes, the snacks, and even the sweets. So this is the key message. Ask the educator that you need to translate that message and work on the implementation, where it comes from. So now I just want to just give you a few minutes of respite between, before the end of the presentation and allow you to breathe the beautiful view and the beautiful sea, because this will be a great segue to talk about the different eating patterns. And the first one that I have there is the Mediterranean style. So I just wanted to, to just help you travel to the Mediterranean. And these are, uh, and since you're going to receive copies of the slides later on, they will be available, I am not going to read through all of them, but I just want to highlight that the key of the different eating patterns, the Mediterranean, which is a stew of different countries, but it focuses on all grains. Once again, we are repeating the same thing using healthy fats such as olive oil, consuming moderate amounts of certain foods that are high in saturated fats, and also focusing on 
locally grown and fruits and vegetables and a variety. And of course, a glass of wine at times. So I love that piece. Uh, then there's the vegetarian or vegan. That would also be an option for patients that, that want to do or try something different. And then the low-fat diet is one that is a little bit more focusing on the amount of fat, a reduction to the right amount, and again, the emphasis is on the right kind of fat. And then we have two more recommendations of the different ones that have been proven to, to have yield optimal results, and that is a low-carbohydrate diet, as well as the DASH diet or the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. So the key message that I want to leave you with is there are different patterns so whether someone chooses a little bit lower carbohydrate, a little bit higher carbohydrate, a different variety, there is a choice for someone that should be individualized. And I think that it speaks beautifully how it dovetails that it is individualized. And I also wanted to add something else, which is, if you're looking at patients from different countries and cultures, there is a way to find out what is it that they're eating and then adapting this to the recommendations based on their favorite foods. So the last uh, few minutes that I have left, I just want to tell you something that I find to be very helpful in practice. The first is using risk communication. And I just want to go briefly through what it means to use risk communication when you're talking to the patient or the client. When you tell someone that he or she is at risk of, and in this, I'm using this example of cardiovascular risk, it is important to talk about what is someone's risk. Am I in danger? If my blood pressure is high, or if my cholesterol level is high, or if I smoke, what is my risk based on those markers compared with someone that doesn't have those conditions? And that's why I always like to use graphs. So in this example, based on the risk factors, you can see the cardiovascular mortality once there are more risk factors. So it is important to communicate that to the patient instead of just providing them with a blanket statement about hypertension leads to. Define it. Where is the patient and what are the risk factors? The other thing that is important when it comes to risk communication is not just to throw the numbers, not to say your goal should be less than seven when it comes to the A1C level. But tell the patient what is your level and this is what the goal should be. Make it very specific so that the patient can understand what is the goal and where is he or she compared to that goal. Show them the risk factors. The other thing that is important is explain numbers that need explanation. And the A1C, this is a chart that I really love because it has side by side the A1C and the blood glucose levels that the patient is more familiar with. So a number from 9 to 7 for someone who doesn't understand what A1C means might not be taken seriously because it's only two points. So if I have an A1C of 9 and the goal is at 7, in my head, I'm thinking, oh, it's not so bad. I'm only two points away from the goal. However, if it's explained that a 9 is an average of 212 and the goal is 154, immediately I can see that there is almost 60 points between where I am and where I am supposed to be also provide uh, treatment strategies and ask 
what are you doing, and then make a suggestion. It's very important to show and to show and ask the patient if this is something that he or she will be amenable to changing. I focus on three things. What am I going to say? What am I going to show? And what is the patient going to do? So let me just give you a few examples of what I mean. If my key message is, I want the patient to choose whole grains, reduce the saturated fats, and replace it with polyunsaturated fats, not carbohydrates, I want to focus on the patient reducing sodium and added sugars. So these are some of the examples that I choose from my real life. So what am I going to say? And I'm using the example of whole grains. Well, going back to risk communication, I want to be very specific. I want to tell them, well, if some studies have shown that if you eat more whole grains, you're going to reduce type 2 diabetes. And what does that mean? I want to quantify it if possible. So I can use examples two servings, or I can say, well, three servings of whole grains have shown to reduce this percentage. I like to be as exact as possible so that it is tangible what I am saying. Then what am I going to show? And that is the show and tell. That is the prop section. What are you going to show so that most of us are visual learners? So... I always think, how can I convey this message and translate that into application? Well, I like to use analogies. In order for me to explain what is the whole grain that I am telling the patient to consume, I compare that to the yolk, to an egg. And I say, well, just like an egg has three parts, so does the grain. And we want to make sure that all those three parts are there when we eat them because each one brings you that nutrient density that you need in order to have the effects that you want. I also want to focus on what what is the patient going to do. And usually, a patient has already given me what, what he or she is eating, and then we talk about swapping. And it has to be based on what the patient wants to change. In this example, I am talking about saturated fats. Again, I talk about what are saturated fats, and I am specific. I say, well, if there is a reduction in the food that you're consuming that has saturated fat, you might see, based on the studies, that your LDL or bad cholesterol or lousy cholesterol can drop from 150 to 135 milligrams per deciliter. I also want to ask them about the food so that then I can provide suggestions and then in a shared decision-making, the patient can select what goals to choose. And because my population is Hispanic, I usually have everything in English and Spanish. I had mentioned how much I enjoy having, um, creating my own um, teaching materials and I like to use graphs. In this example, on the left is what I call their saturated fat-based budget, which is about, based on a 1,200 to 1,500 calorie, less than 10% of the calories from saturated fats. So I use the concept of budgeting, budgeting saturated fats, budgeting carbohydrates, etc. And then I give them an example of different foods and based on their serving size, the amount of saturated fat that each one has. This is a slide that can be used not just for patients that have restricted health literacy, but everyone can appreciate the message at that point. So right there I can see the difference between whole milk and 1%. They can see the difference between one cut of meat and another cut of meat. And this creates awareness to show where is it in their diet, the foods that they're choosing, where are the items that they should be 
looking at and then thinking about replacing so that overall their eating patterns become better. So again, I do a lot of swapping with the patient. And you can see here, this is just an example of what the patient would give me. And last but not least, this is a project that we created for patients that instead of going to restaurants, they were using the short, uh, small mom and pop stores, and they were consuming a lot of different sandwiches, especially at lunchtime, and we were concerned about the amount of sodium. So we wanted to help them to select the cold cuts that had the least amount of sodium. So we created this handout, and as you can see here, going back again to my love of graphs, we indicated what were the different types of cheeses and cold cuts, which ones had more or less amount of sodium, so that when there's not the best choices, I want to offer the better choices the more realistic choices. But everything is guided, and even there is a recommendation there that says, if you consume the high-sodium lunch, then this is what you can do at night and have these other choices that are lower in sodium. Because I am not focused on just one meal. I am focused on what is done day in and day out. So circling back again, to the healthy eating patterns, not just demonizing one meal versus another. And to make sure that your patients know, always use what we call the teach back. Have the patient tell you, uh, what did I learn today? Ask the patients to demonstrate or explain what you have just said. When you go home, how would you share this with your husband or your children? And how would you reconstruct this meal to make it healthier? Then you know whether your explanation actually was clear to the patient. So this is one of my favorite um, slides. And one boy tells the other one, I taught my dog how to sing. And then the young man says, I don't hear anything. And he responds, I said I taught him how to sing, not that he learned. So remember, information is not education. So to conclude, I just want to show you some of the questions that you can post to use the teach back method. You can say things like using your own words, can you tell me? Or many times I say, I have given you so much information. Can, can you tell me in your own words? Or how would you describe this to someone else? So we have come to the end of this presentation. And this is the knowledge check question. The amount of saturated fat for someone with diabetes should be individualized, less than 10% of the calories, less than 30% of the calories, depends on the triglyceride levels. Okay, so let me show you. 55% of you said less than 10% of the calories. So that is the correct answer because the recommendations are that the amount of fat uh, that is recommended it's the same as the general population and the recommendations from the dietary guidelines do specify that the consumption of saturated fats should be less than 10%. So I am going to pass this over to my friend, Betsy, who will give you a summary of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you, Lorena. Uh, we have been blessed of having these great two speakers uh, with us today. As we conclude our overview of this webinar today, we are reminded of the importance 
potential for the guidelines to influence policy as well as practice. Given the significant nutrition-related health issues facing the U.S. population, such as cardiovascular diseases, type 2 diabetes, and certain cancers, the importance of the best possible signs to inform the public regarding dietary recommendation is a paramount. Managing a chronic disease like diabetes requires multiple decisions each day on a range of complex process. There are no vacations, no timeouts. At best conditions like poverty and food insecurity only complicate diabetes self-management. At, at worst, they make effective self-management impossible. This simple fact is true for the million of Americans who live with diabetes while facing food insecurity. We're hoping that with today's webinar, healthcare professionals remind ourselves that we all have a critical role in implementing dietary guidelines recommendations to people with diabetes and at risk. Uh, now we're moving into the Q&A section. We have been getting a lot of great questions, and Gina has been answering some of those. We will try to get to as many questions as possible. So let me see what questions that we have here. Betsy? Yes? So, so there's a question that I just saw that, that I'd be happy to answer. It was a, a question around the WHO and the American Heart Association are recommending an amount of um, added sugar that would be significantly less than what's in the dietary guidelines. So what I would say in response to that is it's, it's very important to understand that the dietary guidelines is saying a maximum of less than 10% of calories. That is not to suggest that 10% that of calories is good or right, but that it really is a maximum. And actually, when the advisory committee did an analysis and looked at how much added sugar could be included in people's diets, what they really found uh, in, in order to then also get all the healthy nutrients you need, what they found is really it's between 4% and 9% of calories depending on the the number of calories you should be consuming. And so really that, that recommendation of less than 10% is setting it at a a high goal from the understanding that right now Americans' consumption is above that. So there's no question that we want to be moving people, that, that no one would be satisfied with getting everyone to 10%, <laughs> that, um, that, that this is pushing for and really trying to, but this is the first time that the dietary guidelines have had a quantitative recommendation for added sugar. And, and I think that's important to realize that the dietary guidelines are not always about the optimal diet, but about moving people in the right direction. And right now, our added sugar consumption is well above the 10%. And so, and that is just a recommendation to less than 10%. Thank you, Shana. I, I, thank you, Shana, for your response. I have a question here for uh, Lorena. Lorena, yes. how do we explain to patients why the total carbs do not equal to fiber and total sugars? Yes. The way that I explain it is uh, I use a nutrition uh, facts label, and then I say that there are different types of carbohydrates and that the total already includes the others, the sugars, etc. So that's the way that I explain that. And uh, there were recommendations in the past that the dietary fiber was sub subtracted from the total amount of carbohydrates, which later on changed to only half of the total uh, fiber would be reduced, and now it's pretty much whatever the amount of carbohydrate is there, that's the amount of it that we count. So I just want to, to just say that I usually say everything is already included in the total amount. So that's the message that I say. And then I use the example, if, if it's 20 grams of carbohydrate and when they look at sugars, it says 10, 
I say you don't have to count this twice, but the 10 is already part of the 20 grams of carbohydrate. Thank you, Lorena. And now, Jen, Jenna, I have a question here that says, what about recommendations for eggs? I'm telling my patients one or two eggs jokes per day, then the rest egg white for patients with no cardiovascular diseases. Yes, so um, of course it's important to know, and and I would not want to say anything if the patients that you are are treating specifically have diabetes. So I'm going to say if that's true, there probably will be a different answer to this question. But yes, I would say that that's a very reasonable recommendation in general, and and it really is kind of moving away from the sort of very rigid anti-egg view that may have come in the past when there were more strict limits on dietary cholesterol and, and it really did hurt the egg industry in a major way that people were, were really avoiding eating eggs that really are a very healthy protein source when, when kept in moderation. I just wanted to, to add a little bit to, to what Jenna just said about the eggs and the emphasis that I try to do is to show that saturated fats and trans fats usually have much more of an impact on dietary cholesterol in general. So I do what Jenna says is just very safe recommendations when it comes to dietary cholesterol but to understand that about 3% of the dietary cholesterol is what impacts blood cholesterol levels and then to focus more on the saturated fats and trans fats in the diet. Good. Um, I have a question here for you, Lori. It says, are there are substitution lists for ethnic foods? Are there substitutions? Well, yes. Yes, there are. There are certain sources that that have looked at different foods of different ethnicities and even religious groups and what are their healthier alternatives. So there is a source of, of that. So I was the co-editor and co-writer of this particular book, so it's, it sounds like a shameless plug, but there are sources that provide this. Will high fructose be eliminated? Oh, well, so at this point, I assume high fructose corn syrup is, um, so of course high fructose corn syrup is considered an added sugar and certainly will be taken into account. Will it be eliminated? Um, there is no, at this point, no regulation that is going to eliminate it from food. I think there is pressure. There are, are a lot of people just in the general public who are pushing against it and so products are, are taking it out and, and replacing it. But I think it is important to know that if they just replace it with other sugar, that's really not addressing the problem of added sugar in people's diets. And so I do think it is important to note that there are a lot of people who maybe feel like, well, if I drink a soda that's made with, um, with, with sucrose, that somehow that's okay because it's no longer high fructose corn syrup. And I think it is important to note that that's still sugar and a lot of sugar certainly in a soda. And it's all added sugar and no other beneficial ingredients. And so I think we need to kind of get away from the notion that if we just get rid of high fructose corn syrup that we'd be, that people would be okay consuming other kinds of sugar. Thank you, Jenna. I would like to have more time for more questions, but we're running out of time. Also, uh, we're in the process of updating one of the most popular resources for the National Diabetes Education Program, which is the bilingual recipe book, Tasty Recipes for People with Diabetes and Their Families. So stay tuned in the next few months to see our updated booklet reflecting some of the changes that have been discussed here today. I like to um, also mention to you that the NDP webinar series is offering continuing education credits 
You will have to complete an online evaluation in order to claim your credits. Just go to the CDC TCEO at the link that is showing at the top of your screen and follow the instructions. You will receive a certificate of complexion too. I'd like to thank everybody that joined us today. Uh, it has been an amazing participation. You have seen my contact information during the Q&A session, so please feel free to contact me. Thank you, Jenna, and thank you, Lorena, for sharing your expertise and word of wisdom. Everyone else, see you next time for another great NDP webinar series. Thank you again, and goodbye.